Witch's Sister by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor, Chapter 3. So the pins had been meant for Marjorie. Lynn woke up early the next morning and lay in bed staring through the row of daisies that lined her window. It was an unusually hot day, so it felt good not to move. Her mind went back to the night before. She had always known that Judith didn't care much for Mouse. She's so sloppy, I don't see how her own mother can stand her, Judith had once said. And that laugh of hers, does she have to go around squeaking like that? Don't make fun of your friends, Lynn had retorted. Oh, I'm not making fun of her, Judith said, but for heaven's sake, don't invite her over when I've got company, that's all. Behind the curtain in the center of the large room, Lynn could hear Judith's breathing, and it made her angry. Mouse was... Pr- Mouse had probably been up half the night with a stomach ache, and Judith slept as though she had nothing whatever to do with it. For a moment, Lynn felt like storming through the curtain, walking, waking Judith up and demanding to know why she'd done it, but she knew how foolish that would be. She got out of bed and tiptoed across the, fl- across the floor. How long had it been since she'd gone in Judith's room anyway? Weeks. Judith had to pass through, Judith had to pass through Lynn's room to get downstairs, but there was no occasion for anyone to go into hers. In fact, the family had been forbidden. It's my room. I'll clean it myself, Judith had told Mother. I want a place that's private, some place I can really call my own. Well, perhaps it was time somebody took a look. Carefully, Lynn pulled the, thir- the thin... Ah, carefully, Lynn pulled the thick curtain aside. The sunlight from her own window fell on Judith's face, and she looked almost angelic, lying there with one arm thrown over the edge of the bed. Lynn's heart beat rapidly as she glanced about the room. She half expected to see bats hanging from the ceiling and a tall pointed hat on the bedpost. The room, however, looked as if it might belong to any 14-year-old girl, except for two items, a broom in one corner and a candle on the dresser. What are you doing? Judith rose straight up in bed so suddenly that Lynn jumped. Before she could answer, Judith said, You're spying, obviously. I told you to stay out. I I just wanted to make sure your windows were open, Lynn stammered. I got too warm. They're always open, Judith lay back down and turned over. Anyway, I couldn't sleep, Lynn added. I was worrying about Mouse. She she was terribly sick last night, Judith's eyes opened. Again, what's wrong with her? A bad stomachache, Lynn watched her sister closely. Probably all that junk she eats, Judith commented. She eats all the time. Now will you please get out and let me sleep? When the mail was delivered that morning, there was an air mail letter for Mrs. Morley, and Lynn decided to take it to her. There was no phone in the hen house to distract Mother while she wrote, and she had asked that someone run up the hill with her mail any time she got something that looked important. It was exactly the opportunity Lynn needed. Mrs. Tuggle's house looked no better by daylight. In fact, its need for paint was even more obvious. But there were no banging shutters or hanging doors or cobwebs stretched across broken windows. From the outside, it simply looked like the house of an old woman who didn't quite keep it up the way she the way she used to. There was an old brick wall, half covered with moss, that led to the barn behind the house, branching off at one point toward the hen house. Lynn found herself standing outside a small building with a low roof. The windows clustered on each end. There was a little stovepipe chimney sticking out the top, and the door had been painted a rusty orange. Strange as it seemed. With her own mother inside, she still felt it proper to knock first. Good, a visitor, mother said cheerfully, opening the screen. Come in and see what I've done with the hen house. Lynn stepped inside and stared. Mother had been busy. The frames around each window were orange like the door, and there was a round braided rug of orange, white, and yellow on the cement floor. The entire back wall, completely covered with built-in boxes where the hens had once nested, now held all manner of writing supplies. Large envelopes in one, small envelopes in another, manila envelopes, reference books, published books, old manuscripts, file folders. Each of them had a special place. Mother's big desk sat at one end under the windows, and a rocking chair perched cozily by the old coal stove, waiting for winter. There were two file cabinets in one corner, plus a few boxes of unsorted odds and ends. Oh, Mother, said Lynn admiringly. Isn't it exquisite? Mrs. Morley burbled. I wanted to wait till I had the curtain up before I let anyone see it, but we'll just consider this a preview, and to think, I get it for only $15 a month plus electricity. Of course, I had to bring my own, I have to bring my own water and a thermos if I need a bath, and if I need a bathroom, I have to use Mrs. Tuggles, 
but it's a studio of my own, way back here where it's quiet and private. She sat down at her desk and opened the letter. I was making myself a cup of tea on the hot plate before the day gets too warm. Why don't you stay and have some with me? It was exactly what Lynn had hoped she would say. She sat down in the rocker and waited. She felt very adult somehow having tea with an author in her studio, and never mind that it was that it was her own mother. Well, Mrs. Morley said, staring at the letter in her hand, guess what? A writer's conference in Illinois wants me to give a lecture next month, all expenses paid. I'm supposed to talk about writing children's books. Isn't that exciting? You mean you'll be going away? Lynn asked somewhat uneasily. Only for a weekend. This is the first time I've been asked. I think I'll celebrate and put a lump of sugar in my tea. She looked like a schoolgirl, Lynn decided, puttering about the hot plate there on the file cabinet. Puttering about the hot plate there on the file cabinet. Her brown hair pulled back with a green scarf. She was barefoot because she always took off her shoes when she wrote. It ventilates the brain, she said, and father thought that exceptionally funny. I feel great today, mother was saying, even though I haven't accomplished a thing. Maybe that's a good sign. She poured the boiling water into two paper cups, added sugar in a tea bag, and handed one to Lynn. It's hot, dear, be careful. Then she sat down on the rug to drink it, legs stretched out in front of her ankles crossed. Well, how are things at home? How should she begin, Lynn wondered. She wished they had been talking of spirits or something, so she could write, so she could work it in naturally. Somehow the whole thing seemed too unbelievable for words, and Lynn was afraid it would all sound crazy. Hmm, Mother asked, watching her. Lynn shrugged. Oh, so-so, sort of average, I guess. Strange. Lynn turned her cup around and around in her hands. It seemed very odd talking with Mother like this, as though she were someone outside the family. If they were home, Mother would be bustling about the kitchen as they talked. Here in the studio, Lynn had her undivided attention. Mother, she said finally, has anyone in our family ever been a witch, an aunt or somebody? Mrs. Morley looked puzzled. Not that I know of. Do you believe in witches? That's hard to say. I'm not sure how to answer. Well, Lynn took a deep breath. I've suspected for a long time that Judith is a witch. She looked straight at her mother, expecting her to laugh, but the same puzzled expression showed on Mrs. Morley's face. Judith, why do you think so? It was easier now. Lynn put down the tea, not really wanting it, and leaned forward. Mother, there are all kinds of reasons, all kinds of strange things happening. You just don't know. Well, let's hear some of them. For months, Judith has been acting very odd. Haven't you noticed? She always wants to be alone, and she doesn't want anybody looking at her. But Lynn, Judith is growing up. She is just 14, and girls change a lot at that age. They're moody and dreamy and keep all sorts of things to themselves. That's just the way they are. Not the way Judith is. I've seen her do spooky things. Yes? One day I was watching her down at the creek and she was humming and the tadpole swam right into her hands like she was calling them. And the way things are happening to everybody else and not to her, like Stevie and me getting poison ivy and Judith not, and I got the flu and cavities and Judith didn't, and that time in Chicago somebody broke into the car and stole all our coats except Judith's. Mother leaned back against her desk. Look, Lynn, it's natural for a younger sister to be a little bit jealous of someone who's older, and sometimes it does seem as though everything good comes her way, but I'm sure it's only coincidence. I'm not jealous, and it's not coincidence, Lynn said hotly. What happened last night was the worst yet. Mrs. Morley stopped drinking her tea. What happened? Mouse and I saw her sticking pins in a doll, and later Mouse got a horrible stomachache. Somehow Lynn couldn't bring herself to mention Mrs. Tuggle. If she did, she might blow the whole thing and Mother would never believe her. Convince her of Judith, Judith's witchcraft first, and then tell her about the old woman. That was the sensible way. Mrs. Morley drew up her knees and wrapped her arms around them, studying Lynn. She was not laughing. You certainly have been very observant of your sister the last few months, Lynn. I had no idea all this was going on. She believed. Lynn slid off the rocker and sat down next to her. We've got to do something about it, Mother, before she does something to Stevie, she said earnestly. Stevie? Yes, because he's not baptized. What? Look, Mouse and I got this book, and it tells all the secrets of witchcraft and everything. 
Lynn was talking so fast she stumbled over her words. Which has greased their broomsticks with the fat of unbaptized babies, and Judith has a broom in her room, and maybe Stevie's all she can get, and the marks she makes on his skin, mother, like claw marks, they're not natural. Lynn, there was a firmness in her mother's voice now, you are an intelligent girl, but you also have a very active imagination. Things might seem pretty suspicious if you're looking for trouble, but undoubtedly, there are good explanations for everything. It's quite possible that you and Marjorie are unconsciously making daily events support what you want to believe, which is that Judith is up to witchcraft. That doll you mentioned is probably her styling mannequin. The scratches are undoubtedly from those long fingernails she's been growing. If you really wrote everything down that happened, you'd see that as many unpleasant things happened to Judith as anybody else. She didn't believe after all. Lynn felt the bottom drop out of her stomach. It was worse to have told Mother everything and find out she didn't believe it than not to have been told at all, than not to have told her at all. Mother, she said in the last desperate attempt to persuade her, have I ever imagined that something actually happened when it didn't? Have I ever told you something that wasn't true? Mrs. Morley looked at her thoughtfully, carefully studying her face. No, Lynn, you haven't. I'll admit that despite your imagination, you are a pretty accurate observer of people, and you sometimes seem to sense what they're thinking and feeling before anyone else. That's something I've always noticed about you. But in this case, I think you are coming to the wrong conclusions about things you have accurately observed. You're wrong, I'm sure, in concluding that any of this is witchcraft. There is nothing left to argue, nothing more to say. Finally, Lynn muttered, I don't think Judas should be taking care of Stevie. If anything happens to him, don't say I didn't warn you. Mrs. Morley chuckled. She reached out and pulled Lynn to her, encircling her with one arm. <laughs> Judith is a very capable babysitter, my dear, and if I didn't think I could trust her, I would I would leave her in charge of the house while I'm working. It's a serious accusation, you know, calling somebody a witch. Lynn pushed away. You won't say anything to Judith, will you? That I can promise, Mother said. But why don't you go have a talk with her yourself? Ask her about some of the things you've told me. Like the tadpole, see what she says. Maybe she can explain it. Maybe, said Lynn, knowing she wouldn't ask. She got up. Well, see you at lunchtime. Lynn went outside and closed the screen. Mother was right about her imagination. Lynn had a way of putting herself in another skin, as Father called it. Sometimes when she lay in bed at night, she would imagine what it would be like to be trapped on the 16th floor of a hotel and have a choice of jumping or burning to death or to have her foot caught on a railroad track and hear a train whistle in the distance, or to be a famous singer and forget the words in the middle of the song by just thinking about it. Lynn could feel the flames or terror, the terror or the panic and embarrassment. Her heart would pound and her palms would perspire and her neck would feel all creepy and back. Sometimes she even moaned. She was sure that she actually knew what such an experience would be like, but never, ever in all her life had Lynn imagined that things were actually happening when they really weren't. There was a difference between being sensitive and being crazy. She took a few steps up the walk and stopped. Through the windows, she could see her mother. She was still on the rug in the same position Lynn had left her, her arms around her knees, and there was a faraway look in her, on her face, as though she were completely absorbed in her thoughts. Maybe she did believe after all and just didn't want to alarm Lynn. Maybe she had known about it all the time and had moved her studio here so she could keep a closer eye on Mrs. Tuttle. Nevertheless, Lynn felt uneasy. She was afraid that Judith would know she had talked to Mother, or perhaps Mrs. Tuggle had seen her coming and guessed. And when she reached home, she was sure of it, because the daisies on her windowsill were dead, all of them. They hung limp and dry over the sides of their pots in the warm noon sun. As soon as she could, she called Marjorie. How you feeling, Mouse? Better, I guess, her voice sounded faint. Mom had to call the doctor. I was up-chucking everything. What did he say? He called it a green apple stomach, except that I haven't had any green apples, and he gave me some medicine and said to stay home today. What do you suppose, Ju what do you suppose Judith has against me, Lynn? I don't know, Mouse, but it's not just you. All my daisies are dead, and they were okay this morning. Lynn was surprised to discover that her voice was shaking. Well, I know one thing. We've got to get that doll away from her before she tries something else. Boy, was I ever sick. You mean, steal the doll? That's exactly what I mean. Lynn was quiet for a moment. Mouse sure didn't sound like a coward. Okay, she said, taking a deep breath. 
Meet me in the cemetery tomorrow afternoon and we'll make plans. One o'clock. A little later, Lynn was dusting the buffet in the dining room when she heard Judith getting out the bucket to scrub the kitchen floor, the work assigned for the day. I wish I had something to do, came Stevie's voice from the kitchen doorway. Go build something with your blocks, Judith suggested. No, Stevie bellowed. I'm tired of blocks. I want something else. Play in the sand, then. I'm tired of sand. Then go find a friend. Don't just hang around griping. Judith finally answered somewhat irritably. I've got plenty to do. What? I've got to scrub the kitchen floor. I want to help. No, you you just make a mess. From the dining room doorway, Lynn could see Stevie taking off his shoes and socks. And a moment later, when Judith's back was turned, he waded across the wet floor, dipped a towel in the bucket, and began flinging it around over the linoleum. Cut that out, Judith demanded. You're slopping all over the place. You always get all the fun things to do, and I don't get any, Stevie wailed. Oh, go drop, Judith snapped. Just get out of here. Stevie padded back out through the door, leaving wet footprints on the oak floor. The screen door slammed. There was a pause, a thud, and then a scream. Lynn dashed out the front door to find Stevie had fallen off the porch and down the steps. His lip was cut, and there was blood on his shirt. Go drop, Judith had said, and then it had happened. And that is the end of chapter three.